In my 33 years, the most thrilling event had been my accounting firm switching from PCs to Macs. Then, everything changed at a friend's birthday party. I stood in a crowded living room, holding a soda, feeling uncomfortable in a too tight dress. The music was deafening, but perfect for him, Charles. Taller than most, he spotted me and walked over confidently. Your ma, right? His voice was clear, even over the loud bass. Yeah, and you are? I sipped my drink, trying to appear calm. Charles. I see you around. Mind if I join you? Without waiting for an answer, he stood next to me. We talked, laughed, and it felt natural, easy. He was into graphic design but stuck in a corporate job he didn't love. As the night wound down, he asked for my number. Something about him felt right. Days blurred after Charles's call. Before I knew it, I was getting ready for our first date. Nerves buzzing, I chose a simple blue dress. Charles picked me up at 7 sharp, his car clean and well kept. Dinner was at a cozy French place. He knew the food was amazing, but my stomach was doing somersaults. Tell me something about you that no one else knows, he said, twirling spaghetti onto his fork. I chuckled, playing with my food. I'm pretty boring, but I can solve a Rubik's Cube in under a minute. He raised his eyebrows. Really? That's pretty cool. You'll have to show me sometime. Sure, I said, starting to relax. What about you? Any hidden talents? I make a mean breakfast burrito, he boasted with a grin. Best you'll ever have. The conversation flowed, and for the first time in a long while, I felt like I was exactly where I was supposed to be. Weeks turned into a whirlwind romance. Charles introduced me to his parents, Brian and Camille. They lived in a small, cozy house full of photos and little decorations. Camille hugged me the second we walked in. Oh, we've heard so much about you, dear, she said, squeezing my shoulders. One evening, a few months into our romance, Charles proposed along the riverbank. The city lights reflected off the water, and it was like a scene from a postcard. Ma, I've been thinking. I don't want to wait any longer. Will you marry me? No hesitation, no doubt. Just a simple, yes, Charles, I'll marry you. After the wedding, life didn't slow down. Charles suggested we move in with his folks to help them out and save money on rent. Three weeks later, there we were, pulling up to his parents' house with our lives packed into boxes. Camille was waving from the porch before we even got out of the car. The first few days were an adjustment. Camille was constantly hovering, always popping into our room to ask if we needed anything. One evening, Charles dropped another bomb. The house needs some major repairs, he announced casually between bites of meatloaf. I choked on my mashed potatoes. Repairs? Yeah, the roof's a mess and the plumbing's from the dark ages, he said. Brian nodded solemnly. We were thinking, Charles continued, avoiding my gaze, that maybe we could all chip in for the costs. I glanced at Camille, who was suddenly very interested in her plate. All of us? I just got this pay cut at work, Charles muttered, so I'm a bit strapped at the moment. There it was. I felt a knot form in my stomach. I'll see what I can do, I managed to say. The next few weeks were a blur of contractors and repairs. I wrote checks and smiled through gritted teeth as Camille gushed about how wonderful the house was looking. Brian slapped me on the back. You're really part of the family now, Ma. After the renovations, the house looked great. We decided to throw a small dinner party to celebrate. That's when everything took an unexpected turn. Camille suddenly got quiet. We need to tell you both something important, she said, her voice shaky. The house is mortgaged heavily. We owe $300,000, and the bank could take it away if we don't settle the debt in three months. My fork clattered to my plate. What? All the repairs we just paid for? Charles looked at me, his eyes avoiding mine. I was hoping maybe, Ma, you could talk to your father. I was furious, but the tears and the pleading wore me down. I'll think about it, I finally muttered, 
feeling trapped. The next day, I called my dad, explaining the situation. To my surprise, he agreed to help, but on one condition. I'll give the money, ma, but only with a formal agreement. A receipt. I want everything documented. When I told Charles about my dad's condition, he wasn't happy. Why does it have to be so formal? Can't he just trust us? It's $300,000, Charles. It's a lot of money, and he's just being cautious, I argued, feeling the distance between us grow. The paperwork was drawn up, and the money was transferred. Camille and Brian were relieved, constantly thanking me. But the air between Charles and me had changed. There was a coldness that wasn't there before. Just when I thought my life couldn't get any darker, tragedy struck. My dad had a heart attack and didn't make it. I was devastated. Exhausted from funeral planning, I came home earlier than usual one day. As I inserted my key into the front door, I heard voices from the living room. It was Charles, his tone dripping with frustration and disgust. I can't do this anymore. Living with her is driving me nuts. She's just, it's too much, Charles complained. His mom, usually so sweet and understanding, replied in a stern whisper, you have to hold on a bit longer, Charles. We need to figure out what to do with those receipts your father-in-law had. Ma has them now. The sooner I get out, the better. I'll grab those receipts and destroy them. Then I'll start all over again with that rich beauty I told you about, Charles said, his voice cold and calculated. I felt a chill run down my spine. Here I was, mourning my father, while the people I thought I could trust were plotting behind my back. I realized the family I lived with wasn't the loving family I thought I married into. Instead, they saw me as a way to fix their financial troubles. Rage mixed with shock, but I knew I had to keep my cool. I slammed the door loudly, as if I had just come in, disrupting their scheming. Oh, Ma, you're back early. How did everything go with the funeral plans? Camille's voice shifted instantly to one of concern, her eyes wide with fake innocence. I forced a smile, my stomach turning. It's all coming together. Thanks for asking. As I spoke, I could see the quick glances they shot each other, their faces a mask of fake concern. It made my skin crawl knowing their true colors, but I realized that showing my cards now wouldn't help. I needed to be smart. I needed to protect what was mine and possibly even get some justice for their deceit. The funeral was somber, the air heavy with grief and murmured condolences. But as the ceremony wrapped up and we returned to Charles's parents' house, the true colors of the family I married into began to show. As we gathered in the living room, sipping on lukewarm coffee, Charles's demeanor shifted. His usually charming facade crumbled away, revealing something more sinister. With a cold laugh, he looked straight at me and dropped the bomb. Ma, pack your things. You need to get out. I've got someone else now. Someone better. His words should have felt like a slap, but I pretended to be stunned. Before I could respond, Camille chimed in with a snide giggle. We've really had enough of you, dear. We only put up with you for your money. What about the house? I asked, fading. The house that I paid to fix. The $300,000 I poured into it. Camille laughed harder, as if I told the best joke of the year. Oh, sweetie, this house is ours. You're nothing here. Charles's smirk widened. And those receipts you're so proud of? Found them in your dad's house and burned them. They're gone. For a moment, I let them believe they had one. But then, I couldn't help it. I burst into laughter, my reaction confusing them, their smiles faltering. Why are you laughing? What's so funny? Charles demanded. I wiped a tear from my eye, still chuckling. You three are just pathetic. You think you're so clever. The receipts you destroyed? They were copies. The real ones are safe with my lawyer. The color drained from their faces. Charles's arrogance turned to panic. You can't prove anything, he stammered. I can and I will, I shot back, my voice steady and firm. Now, I want my money back. 
all of it. Or my next call is to the police. Charles and Brian looked at each other, their earlier confidence replaced by fear. Brian, usually so bold and brash, began to plead. Ma, please, let's talk about this. We can sort something out. With the truth out and leverage in my hands, negotiations with Charles and his parents dragged on longer than I expected. It was clear they were trying every angle to sway the terms in their favor, but I wasn't about to budge. Look, it's simple, I stated firmly during one of our many discussions at their now legally mine kitchen table. The house gets transferred to my name in exchange for the money. That's the deal. No more games. Finally, they relented. We all agreed that the best course of action was to make everything official and legal. I insisted that everything be documented by a lawyer and confirmed with the proper papers. I want no corners cut, I emphasized. At the lawyer's office, the atmosphere was tense as documents were signed and notarized. I watched closely as each signature was applied, ensuring there was no room for further deceit. Once everything was finalized, I collected the documents related to the transfer and turned to Charles's mother, who looked deflated yet somehow still carried a hint of her former hostess charm. I'll be keeping these in a safe place, I said, holding up the papers before slipping them into a folder. Just to ensure no one is tempted to pull any stunts. With the legalities handled, the divorce proceedings were straightforward. Charles was quiet, his earlier arrogance nowhere to be seen. When the final papers were signed, I felt a weight lift off my shoulders. A chapter closed. On the day they moved out, I stood on the porch of my now fully owned house and watched Charles, his mom, and dad carry their belongings to a rental van. Their movements were slow, the mood somber. I couldn't help but feel a mix of satisfaction and sorrow. This wasn't how I imagined my marriage ending, but under the circumstances, it was the best possible outcome. After everything settled down and I began to enjoy my newfound peace, word got back to me through friends about Charles and his situation. Apparently, the grass wasn't greener on the other side. His mistress had dumped him not long after our divorce, and his parents were now crammed into a tiny apartment, a big downgrade from the comfortable house they once had. It seemed karma had caught up with them quicker than I expected. Despite their situation, they started reaching out to me, bombarding me with calls and messages, probably hoping to weasel their way back into my life or, at least, my house. But I was done with their deceit. I blocked their numbers without a second thought and blacklisted them on all social media. It was liberating to cut the final threads that connected us. One afternoon, as I was enjoying a quiet moment with a book in my living room, there was a knock at my door. Peering through the peephole, I saw Charles standing there, a pathetic figure holding a bouquet of flowers. The audacity of it made me scoff. Opening the door, I couldn't help but laugh outright at the sight of him. Really, Charles? Flowers? I leaned against the door frame, not hiding my amusement at his discomfort. He shuffled uncomfortably, the bouquet seeming to wilt along with his spirits. Ma, I... I've realized so many things. I was wrong. Terribly wrong. Remember when you told me I disgusted you? I interrupted, almost feeling sorry for him. Almost. You're not here to make things right, Charles. You're just desperate to get back to your comfortable life. But guess what? That life doesn't exist anymore. Not for you. His face fell, and he took a step back as if my words were physical blows. Ma, please, save it, I cut him off sharply. I want you to leave. Don't come back here. We're done. Forever. Charles stood there for a second longer, his hope visibly crumbling. Then, without another word, he turned and walked away, his shoulders hunched in defeat. I returned to my book, feeling a sense of finality and relief. I smiled to myself, feeling the quiet of the house wrap around me like a comforting blanket. It was such a stark contrast to the chaos that once filled this space, the constant noise, the tension, the deceit. All of it was gone now. I could finally breathe deeply without the weight of worry on my chest. I was finally at peace, living life on my terms. I glanced around the room, taking in the calm atmosphere. The sun streamed in through the windows, 
casting a warm glow over everything. I realized how much I loved this house now that it was truly mine. The walls, once witnesses to arguments and schemes, now seemed to echo with serenity and contentment. I thought back to the days of turmoil and manipulation, remembering how trapped I felt. Charles and his family had taken so much from me, both emotionally and financially. But now, they were out of my life for good. No bouquet of flowers or sweet talk could change that. Their attempts to manipulate me were over. As I sipped my tea and returned to my book, I felt a sense of triumph. I had faced betrayal and heartbreak, but I had come out stronger on the other side. I had taken control of my life and my future. The peace I felt now was well-earned and deeply cherished. I was truly, finally free, free from lies, free from deceit, and free to live my life as I chose. The future stretched out before me, full of possibilities and opportunities. I smiled again, knowing that whatever came next, I was ready for it. <laughs>